William Hoagland is known for blending dramatic historical narrative with critical interpretation, and he has a knack for making surprising connections between his subjects and contemporary polit political and cultural struggles. His books include the much praised The Whiskey Rebellion, which UCLA historian Gary Nash called the most compelling and dramatically rendered history of the rebellion ever written. Founding Finance, How Debt, Speculation, Foreclosures, Protests, and Crackdowns Made Us a Nation, and Declaration, The Nine Tumultuous Weeks When America Became Independent, May 1st through July 4th, 1776. He also contributed articles and essays about history, music, and politics to a number of publications, including the Atlantic Monthly, the New York Times, and Salon. In Autumn of the B Black Snake, Hoagland tells the story of the creation of the U.S. Army and its first victory against the indigenous people of the Ohio Valley and how that opened the way to, settle, to Western settlement. You local history buffs have probably figured out from the title that Philadelphia's own General Anthony Wayne is prominently featured in the book. Please welcome William Hoagland. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to be in Philadelphia, and good to be in the Free Library of Philadelphia. First time giving a talk here, and I'm very excited about just being here in itself. Um, I, write about, uh, I write about the early republic, mostly, um, the early days of, of the republic, and um, I write about resistance to the republic. I write about resistance to the founding that the founders that we know about actually in the end did succeed in achieving. Um, so I wrote about the Whiskey Rebellion in that context. Um, I wrote about the politics behind the uh, Declaration of Independence in which, um, in which an alternative version of how the country might run contributed, uh, populist egalitarian ideas contributed uh, very much to the bringing about of the Declaration and then that kind of got superseded by the powers that were. Um, and then this book, uh, Autumn of the Black Snake, is kind of the biggest, in a way, the biggest resistance to the founding of this nation because it's actually a military resistance. I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, it took a lot of struggle and a lot of effort, and it wasn't just a philosophical resistance. It was an actual resistance by warfare. So what I tell people this book's about, like, what's your book about? Well, it's about uh, the first war this nation ever fought. And then there's a sort of a pause because... Well, we're thinking the revolution, you know, of course, that was the first war, but that wasn't the nation. This is the first war the United States fought as a nation. And our minds, your minds, my mind, most people's minds, then have tr traditionally kind of gone from the revolution to the War of 1812, maybe, you know, and then we move on to the Civil War. And, and guess what? No, the first war this nation ever fought um, comes before the War of 1812 and after the revolution. And um, it's... You know, and of course, because I wrote a whole book about it, I think it's the most important thing that pretty much ever happened at this point. But um, all writers, you know, that's their main thesis of their book. It's like what I'm writing about is the most important thing that ever happened, so you all ought to buy my book. That's thesis number one for most books. However, this thing, I mean, I didn't, I didn't start writing about this and then decide to frame it as really, really important. I, um, I kept bumping into it and finding surprising importance to this thing. And I just felt like, given the fact that it's the first war, wouldn't it just be pretty important anyway? And what I discovered was that uh, the, not only was it the first war uh, we ever fought as a nation, ever waged, but it was the war in which the US Army was formed. In fact, before this war, after the revolution, there was no US Army. There was no US military establishment at all. And you know, there is today. So it had to start somewhere. And where it started is in the process of the story I'm telling here. And it wasn't only that, it's also the war that actually um, um, conquered for the US what became the American Midwest, which, as we all know, of course, became like the heartland of not just the agricultural heartland for a time, but also the industrial heartland, the industrial driver of what made America great as a global power around the world. And it all sort of starts here. 
So what becomes, you know, as I just start talking about it, and even as I'm talking about it right now, it continues to kind of blow my mind that we don't really know anything much about this war, that we think Revolution, 1812, Civil War, etc. Like, it just drops out of the story. Because it isn't just an interesting little sidebar that would be good to know about. It's actually kind of critically important to the very formation of the nation. Um, and it doesn't have a name, actually. Uh, that's how little we know about it. So... Um, I'm going to start by reading some excerpts from the prologue in the first chapter. They're both pretty short anyway, and I'm going to shorten them radically even further. Um, as a way of kind of, you know, it's, because it's so little known, and I think it's so important, uh, I'm going to, I have to kind of invite the reader into the journey, because we're going places we're not used to going. And so I'm kind of going to invite, in a short version, invite you into the journey as well by actually just reading what I've written by way of that kind of invitation. And it starts, the prologue is called The Ruins of an Old French Fort. And as that sort of tips you off, we're starting as backstory in a place um, and a time that might also seem a little surprising, but we can talk about sort of why, why we might need to start it here. And it goes a little something like this. Where the Mississippi River drains North America on the southward tilt, ceaselessly carving and enriching the bottomland, France once gave a name to an expanse fanning asymmetrically eastward and westward from that spine of moving sediment. Saying its name in rude mimicry of Cajun, Quebecois, or the Paris street, like a guttural unwa, would parody how a new Frenchman might have pronounced what his trading partners, designated savage, called that expanse. Of Europeans, it was traders, soldiers, villagers, and administrators of France who first came to know the Illinois country. They knew it for a long time. But unlike the English speakers who came later, the French never knew that region as an American West. They did go West. Early on, they navigated Lake Superior before they even knew about Lake Erie. They would name the Platte and ascend the Missouri. French traders would lift their eyes to the white peaks of the Rockies, but that wasn't the main thing. The main thing, once it was sorted out and made feasible, was to travel up the St. Lawrence River from the Citadel, Quebec, into Lake Ontario, portage around the gigantic falls of the Niagara River into Lake Erie, embark upon rivers running down to wider rivers, cross more of the land bridges known as portages, and finally enter the Mississippi itself as it moved so treacherously but steadily lower to posts below sea level at New Orleans and Biloxi and emerge at last in the Gulf of Mexico. This empire wasn't western but transmarine. It stretched from the St. Lawrence's mouth at the Atlantic to the Mississippi's mouth at the Gulf. And I'm skipping, so I'm just pose this question rhetorically. Why? Why? Why have an empire like that? And I'll tell you the answer. Like other people, Europeans had to wear hats. There was no imaginable alternative to covering the head. And a hat had become the standard means, so demand was ceaseless. Smooth, warm fur of the big beaver made the best felt for peltry hats, as well as for other garments. And the beaver had grown scarce in Europe, with a market nevertheless unsaturated thanks to price. Discovering the outlandish abundance of giant beavers in North America had been like discovering gold and silver or a license to coin them. The supply was evidently inexhaustible, and obtaining it was easy. By the mid-17th century, a host of indigenous cultures, expert in extracting the resource, had become eager for, dependent on, everything that Europe made in such high volume, metal, buttons, muskets, glass, tailoring, brandy, and more, and forts. It was in service of getting beaver and other furs that the French became such great woodland fort builders. Illinois country Indians often sought protection from the powerful, aggressive Iroquois confederation to the east, and the French built forts, usually with the permission of their trading partners, on the high banks of the Mississippi itself, others they garrisoned near strategic confluences of the many tributaries. A few permanent settlers hugged the network in support, and the villages were nice, with houses standing gaily painted in rows along the riverbanks. While English speakers to the east thought of this region as remote, the more cosmopolitan forts were scenes of balls and soiree. Villagers owned mirrors, billiard tables, and neat kitchen gardens. Many years later, American soldiers discovering the ruins of an old fort on the Great Miami River in the former Illinois country would conclude that no Indian nation could have enjoyed sole hegemony there. The French had been there too. 
New France villagers wore the latest Paris fashions. So they wore, of course, the American beaver. Of peltry from America, the hatters of France made thousands and thousands of hats, and French merchants and shippers sold some of them across the sea to the French Americans. That all went on for nearly 100 years. Uh, and that is a potted version of uh, what's known as mercantilism, or an oddball riff on the idea of mercantilism. Um, and now we're going to jump into chapter one, and again, pieces of chapter one. Chapter one is called uh, The Death of General Butler. On a November morning in 1791, nearly 30 years after the French crown abandoned its American empire, a man named Richard Butler sat against a mattress propped against the base of an oak, dying in pain near a bend of the upper Wabash River. Butler came from Pennsylvania, and to him, this cold ground, once called the Illinois country, lay indisputably in the American West, specifically in the Northwest Territory of the United States. Close by and in the distance, others were dying too, hundreds of them. Some screamed and some groaned, and through the smoke of exploded gunpowder came a deafening cacophony of musket and rifle fire, triumphant screams of the enemy, and orders yelled in English and being ignored. Around the wounded butler, a group of men and officers crouched in hurried conference. Butler started laughing. Evidently, he'd registered the shrieks of a cadet nearby and was struck by the sheer intensity of that noise. He was a heavy man, and as he laughed, his sides shook his coat. Some of the men around him were grieved to think he had no chance. Others thought he might make it if they could only remove him from the scene, but it was becoming horribly clear that getting out of here at all, let alone lugging a large man, was more unlikely every second. Most of the officers were dead. The numb-fingered soldiers left alive had been firing as best they could, but as the enemy began to breach the perimeter, they gave up collapsed their formations, and crowded by terrified instinct toward the center of the field of battle. There they were easy to shoot down en masse. Now where Richard Butler sat propped, his youngest brother, Captain Edward Butler, appeared, carrying on his back another brother, Colonel Thomas Butler, both legs broken. In pain and with no time to spare, arrows were thrumming into the row of tents the Butler brothers tried to confer. And if you read the book, you can find out what happens to the Butler brothers. Um, I'm going to jump, however, because we don't have time, uh, to another, as Shakespeare would say, in another part of the forest, uh, elsewhere in the battle. Somewhere in the smoke and noise and chill of that November morning were Little Turtle and Blue Jacket. Little Turtle would be leading Miami forces, Blue Jacket the Shawnee, and both were leading the whole thing. The scene so chaotic and horrific for American soldiers was for the Indians becoming a thrilling victory, thanks to precise planning, irreproachable execution, and full coordination of forces led mainly by those two men, along with the Delaware war, war leader, Bakonga Halas. Little Turtle and Blue Jacket never agreed on much. Those who talked about them at the time and would write about them in the future, some praising Blue Jacket to the detriment of Little Turtle, others vice versa, never agreed either. But that November morning, as a man they'd come to see as their nemesis sat dying under an oak, they were in agreement on at least one thing. This was a war for the survival of their people, and they would work together to win it. The victory they were even now achieving against US forces represented a triumphant step forward in that war for survival. It was English speakers, of course, who called the Miami leader Little Turtle, sometimes the Little Turtle, sometimes only Turtle. In his language, he was called something English speakers phonetically approximated as Michikiniqua, referring to the common painted turtle of North America. Blue Jacket's name had once been something sounding like Sepatekinate, which comes into this language as the big rabbit. But he changed it to something that might be translated as whirlpool. And the handle Blue Jacket had nothing to do with either of his other names. There was a reason for it, but nobody remembered what it was. You had to be there. Today, the Indians had encircled the Americans' camp in a crescent, with Blue Jackets, Little Turtles, and Bakangahalis' men making up the crescent space, and fighters from other nations on each horn. Then the crescent moved, synchronized. The leader's base charged the camp's center, while the horns, not charging, ran all the way around the outside of the camp's perimeter. Caught in that net, the Americans never had a chance. That's what the men whom English speakers called Blue Jacket and Little Turtle were good at. It took collaboration. 
So that's the inciting incident that begins the story I'm going to tell. That's the battle that actually starts this war for what became the Midwest. I'd like to say that's a little version of the, um, of the famous defeat of General Arthur Sinclair on the Upper Wabash, except it's not famous. And so it, it was famous at the time. Everybody was pretty freaked out by it at the time on the American side and pretty excited about it on the Indian side. But for some reason, it's not famous. And that's despite the fact that I'm not going to read everything about this, but I just will give you some statistics here. Um, Sinclair led about 1,500 officers and men, plus dozens of others, soldiers, wives, girlfriends, and children. And by the way, this is how they, they conducted some of these battles. Um, you know, it wasn't just the soldiers. There were, of course, there were civilians attached, uh, contractors, baggage handlers, drivers. But they also brought uh, wives, girlfriends, and children, and babies as well. Um, to a bivouac on the bend of the Upper Wabash, failed to fortify his encampment. Uh, about 650 American troops died that morning, uh, including nearly all of the officers, along with 50 civilians, including nearly all of the women and children. Some claim the total of the dead was more like 900, plus about 300 horribly wounded. So that's nearly a third of the nation's troops at the time uh, wiped out in a few hours. And the survivors took away unforgettable horror at the torture and mutilation to which the dying were exuberantly and ritually subjected. Again, I'll pass over the details of that for now. Um, so, so it, um, it wasn't just a big deal. It was actually in our history and in indigenous people's history on this continent, it was the biggest, by far, the biggest victory over US troops that indigenous people would ever have throughout the entire famous Indian Wars that you sort of know more about now. Like, you know, think about Sitting Bull and Custer. Think about the, all of the Plains Indian Wars. Um, there's no comparison to the number of US casualties. Uh, a guy who knows all about the Plains Indian Wars told me the other day something I didn't even know, which is um, on, on this morning, um, the number of people wiped out was about the same as were wiped out throughout the entire ensuing Plains Indian Wars in all of those decades, about 900 uh, US casualties. Uh, up to 900, around 900, some say even more uh, this morning. Um, and yet we don't really know about it. We don't really know about Blue Jacket and Little Turtle. Um, even though they did a whole lot more than Sitting Bull did to prevent or obstruct and slow down, at the very least, uh, white expansion westward. So here's the, here's the thesis of the book. Here's like in magazine writing, they call this like the nut graph. A fundamental shift was about to begin in Ameri North American life. With the losers' outrage and terror deepening in response to Sinclair's awful defeat on the Wabash, and with the winners' excitement over their great victory mounting, a war would begin. The existence, purpose, and future of the United States of America was formed in that war, and yet it would be forgotten. The first war the United States ever fought, in which the US Army itself came into being, would never even be given a name. So with major claims like that, and we're talking about the Midwest and so forth, people want to know. Here's the, the natural question with which I end this chapter. Uh, so this all took place in present day where? You can walk a pleasant, quiet main street in what is now Western Ohio to a plaque marking the site of Richard Butler's death. Richard Butler died. I gave this part away. But uh, you can find out about his brothers if you read the book. Uh, mark a plaque marking the site of Richard Butler's death. But that's the wrong answer. You can get the address in seconds. It won't help. Butler died in a deep woods, the trees widely spaced and so big around that it would take many men to circle some of them. It was late fall. The branches probably not yet completely bare. So if the smoke hadn't been so thick, some sky might have been visible, but you'd have to tilt your head back to see it. And in summer, that place was dim, full of bird song and the sound of wind in leaves, the branches creaking far overhead. But it's not just the shorn land and artificially exposed sky that make it impossible for us to go where this story took place. It's not even the astonishing rarity of descendants of the people who had lived there for so long. The story of the only indigenous alliance to win battles that might have defeated American expansion into the West, and the story of the founding of the US Army, with all of its world historical future coded in embryo, in the first war that the United States ever fought, the story, that is, of Americans' real emergence as a national people, is set in regions we don't recognize, map to our world, or have any bearings in. So that's the invitation to the, to the story. We're going into some strange places, um, some strange country, literally some strange country, country that, you know, if you're in Ohio and the rest of the Midwest now, you won't see those forests anymore. 
Um, but also I think it's strange sort of um, national territory, strange psychological territory, um, strange imaginative territory. Um, what I can't do in the uh, time that we actually have left is, um, is uh, tell you everything that's in this book. You'll be happy to know because uh, there's too much to talk about like that. So I just want to give you a, a couple of sort of a list almost of stuff that happens in this book that I think is pretty interesting and that maybe we'll bounce off, uh, bounce off a little bit if we do some, some Q&A or some discussion. Um, there are also famous characters in this book. Uh, George Washington, uh, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson. It's not all people who are not household names. Those guys are household names. Um, and what we see them doing in this book is getting, is getting an army going, um, you know, actually working hard from the executive branch to create an army. Because there was huge opposition in the, in the Congress to having a standing, national, professionally organized American army. There was all kinds of opposition to the idea of a standing army, a peacetime establishment. That's like, well, that's what King George has. You know, that's what European armies have. That's a tool of monarchy. We don't want that in this country. So to get that, um, uh, coming out of this, this defeat, uh, Washington and the rest of his cabinet worked very hard. So well, one of the things we have is we have Hamilton and Jefferson, for example, who we talk about all the time as kind of like the two divergent trends in America, sort of founding, founding trends in American culture. What we see them doing here is actually, instead of talking about things that, were, that they're famous for, what we see them here doing, it, they show up for work every day and they work, they do their jobs. Um, the cabinet was a, was a job. Being a cabinet official was a job. And what they did, they didn't sit around, you know, we're so used to sort of reading about Jeffersonian ideas and Hamiltonian ideas about how America ought to be, so that we can't, it's hard for us to imagine them in action like this. But their action was work, and they did their jobs, and they, they didn't sit around thinking big thoughts all the time. They actually did the hardcore, hardball politics necessary to push Congress reluctantly, kicking and screaming, into f forming a national army. This is probably one of the signal achievements of George Washington. I mean, heck, I think it is one of the, I know it's one of the signal achievements of George Washington's administration. Um, and it was, it was difficult. Here we get for the first time, for example, um, really the, the struggle between the executive branch and the representative branch and what it takes for the executive to put the congressman sort of on notice and in political positions where they can't not do what he wants. Um, so we see, we see deal making going on. We see Washington cutting private deals with senators. We see very adroit use of the political system and the media of the day to pressure, to pressure congressmen to do what the executive wants. If you're interested at this exact moment in our current history in this impossible struggles between executive and representative branches, um, this is really the beginning of that. In fact, um, this, the first investigation of the presidency by Congress occurs as a result of Sinclair's defeat. Um, happens in this book. The first um, invocation and beginning to talk about the idea of executive privilege, um, which of course we saw in Watergate, and it has reared its head since and before and may again, um, comes up here in this book, first time ever, because uh, you know, the Congress wanted some papers, and the cabinet, did, this had never happened before. The Congress is demanding some papers. Do we hand over our executive papers to the Congress? I mean, I don't know. Who knows, you know? It's not in the Constitution what you're supposed to do about that. So they had a meeting, and uh, Washington's advisors told him, well, you can hand them over, you know, this time, but don't say, it. you do it because you want to, not because they're telling you to, you know? It's like, there's not, you're not setting a precedent. The privilege is yours. The judgment is yours. Has that issue been perfectly resolved to this day? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. So then that starts here. Um, so, so in order to, so, so when they get this army bill through, and they do, there's no suspense about that. You know, we have an army and a lot of other military as well now. I mean, they get the army bill through, of course. Um, the purpose of getting that army was really, um, the purpose of getting that army was to conquer the territory they had just failed to conquer. Um, but you needed, you needed a real professional army to do that. And heretofore, it had been short-term enlistments. You know, their enlistments end with the, with the end of the mission. Also, they're using militia, and Washington disliked militia. You know, he was just vocal about the fa idea that, you know, there's, a, there's an idea in American culture, in American um, popular culture, and it, it, it's pretty common that, that militia kind of, that the, the yeoman militia won the Revolutionary War. Washington felt that, that the militia had almost lost the Revolutionary War. He wanted a standing army from coming out of the Revolution. He tried to get the Continental Congress to form a peacetime establishment of some professional kind. They wouldn't do it because of the unpopularity of that idea. Um, so one historian has said Sinclair's defeat, while a horrible disaster for, for America at that moment, also um, 
the, the historian John Furling said something like, you know, it was a godsend for Washington because he'd been trying to get this anyway, a professional army. Now there was no, now there was no chance of not getting it because the congressman couldn't possibly imagine, like, what if something else happens now and you didn't vote for the standing army, you know? Um, so you get, you get that whole idea. Now the territory they were trying to get, um, which I just described a little bit, um, You'll, there are maps in the book, and you know, to some extent we need maps for this, because while I'm saying it's Ohio and Indiana and so forth, that geography didn't have those demarcations in those days, of course. So, um, so there's, the, there's, the, there's this territory that they want to get, but it wasn't like this. It wasn't like, okay, we've just had this revolution, we we're free from England, what should we do? What, what, you know, what, any, any policy ideas? Should we like, start looking for something to do? Like what, it, uh, oh, there's this Western territory out there. Maybe we should go get that. That area had been ceded to the US by Britain as a, as a condition of ending the, the war of independence. But in real life, it had also, the, the American desire to get a hold of that territory, American elites, American investors' desire to get a hold of that ter territory long precedes the revolution. In fact, George Washington was only one of the people, but the most important one, who kind of came into himself as a man in his society in Virginia through f exploring that area, surveying it. A lot of people know Washington was a surveyor as a young man, um, and, um, and also investing in it. Um, and so the British had been trying to keep Americans from straying into that territory because the British were trying to keep the Indian fur trade going. The Americans wanted to invest heavily in millions and millions and millions of fertile acreage in order to develop it, uh, sell it, rent it, develop it, etc. Um, the, the, and in fact, that's an, a driver also of nationhood, not only of independence, but also of forming a nation, was to try to make, have a more efficient way of getting a hold of that territory and realizing its incredible value. I mean, in those days, the, if you think about natural resources, like what are the great natural resources that people will kill, you know, fight, bleed, and die to get? Well, in those days, it was land. It was land. They weren't even thinking about the mineral extraction issues yet, you know. So, um, so there was a massive real estate investment uh, involved here. And this is a place where military power and real estate development power come together. And this is a, is a key driver of forming the nation. Um, the Times had a story the other day with a paragraph that began, the New York Times, I should say. Uh, I'm from New York, so we just say the Times, like it's the only place thing called the Times. Um, th but it had a story about, uh, well, I don't know what it was about. It was a the, the sentence went like this. As the first real estate developer president, comma, Trump faces the, f and it goes on like that. And I'm like, well, you know, I don't know how many there are, have been, a real estate developer presidents, but the first president of the United States was a real estate developer. Um, first, before he became a politician, or et cetera, he was a real estate developer. That's how he was making his money. That's how he was getting ahead in the world. He was a successful real estate developer. And there are many other uh, aspects of his character and personality that would distinguish him potentially in some people's minds from uh, Trump. But, he was, but Trump is not the first real estate developer uh, president. So uh, you'll get all that in the book. Um, now I have to, you know, before I close this talk part and we do some Q&A, I have to mention a little more about uh, Little Turtle and Blue Jacket. Um, again, are these household names? No, they're not. Um, is Sitting Bull a household name? Yeah, kind of pretty much. Crazy Horace Geronimo. Those Plains Indian Wars who never had anything like the kind of victory over U.S. forces that Sitting, that, uh, sorry, Little Turtle. Sorry, Little Turtle. Sorry, Blue Jacket. Uh, that those, these two guys had in their amazing collaboration. And their relationship was also so interesting because they were such totally different personalities, had different ideas about strategy and tactics, um, had very different presences in the world, um, but they collaborated very effectively. And then as often happens with victory in a kind of coalition or a partnership, when you actually succeed in doing something, now all the tensions between the partners start to come out and sort of the things that are different. So they also, you know, they had great victory and then they had a great, great failure, of course, because again, no suspense in the end, you know, uh, the US did achieve victory in that area. Um, but I, 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 I'm defensive about my guys here, Blue Jacket and Little Turtle, because, you know, Tecumseh, I, I was writing this, I was working on writing this book, and I would tell people what the story's about, and they'd go, it's about a, confed a huge confederation of, of indigenous nations that actually really resisted U.S. incursion westward and had a huge impact. And people go, oh, uh, like Tecumseh, Tecumseh. 
That's a name that a lot of people know uh, from that time. I'm like, no, not Tecumseh, you know, Blue Jacket and Little Turtle. Blue Jacket and Little Turtle. Um, I'm like, I'm not even under any delusions at this point that if I keep saying that, anyone's going to really, they really will become household names. Um, but regardless of whether they ever become household names, it's just a, fa it's just a weird fact of the, how we look at our history, I think. Um, and it's not just a matter of indigenous uh, American history, Native America. It's, it's the history of the country, you know, uh, from every angle. It's a weird fact that we always want to run to Tecumseh, who, by the way, won no battles against the United States. Um, so Little Turtle and Blue Jacket's relationship and the things that went well for them and then the things that went sort of tragically poorly for them um, are a, a critical uh, a part of this story. Um, and I, I wish they were better known. And here's, the weird, here's another weird aspect of this. If, if, if you're researching this, if you're one of the very few people who does, like me, um, you will come across this whole sort of weird uh, war among historians and writers about Blue Jacket and Little Turtle. Like, people who like Blue Jacket really, really hate Little Turtle, <laughs> and vice versa. And like, no one's ever heard of these people. Like, why are you having a whole throwdown over which guy was better, which guy was worse? I mean, let's just try to get them, you know, back where they belong in terms of the public consciousness. But, and actually, it just seems crazy to me because it was their relationship. The differences between them, it's their relationship that makes them interesting in some ways, not pick your guy and like, you know, go to the mat for Blue Jacket. I mean, they were both really interesting people. And they did some really good things together. And then they had some problems, you know? Um, but, but it's amazing. Like, and I guess that's something that I want to bring out before I get to the, the final uh, main character of the book, who I should talk about before I quit. Um, everything I'm talking about here that, se that, that has seemed, when I've talked to other people about it, seemed so obscure to me when I first came across this. Um, you know, all of this, I say it's not known. We don't talk, I, I don't mean it's not known. It's known to history. There's tons of scholarship on this story uh, and all the aspects of it that I tried to bring together. If it weren't known to scholars, it wouldn't be known to me. That's how I got, you know, I've read a lot of primary sources and I've read a lot of secondary sources. Those secondary sources exist. It's that it's not in the public discussion. Um, and that, and then when you get into the academic world, you know, a lot of people are just, you know, fighting these battles that uh, really very few people are invested in. Um, so that's just another weird feature of the story itself. And I talk a little bit about that, but not in the text of the book, more in my notes. So for those who like historiographical battles among obscure scholars, you can you know, check that out too. Um, but let me, get to, uh, let me get to the Black Snake. Uh, it is called Autumn of the Black Snake. And uh, that name refers, it's a name given by his enemies in grudging respect to General Wayne. Uh, Anthony Wayne, also known to many of his men, sometimes affectionately, I believe, uh, but with a certain sort of, hmm, yeah, uh, Mad Anthony. Uh, many people don't know who he was either, which is weird. I think here in Philadelphia and in the eastern part of Pennsylvania, at least, I think his name is probably a lot better known. Um, but that's not, that's not universally true. Uh, in American, people who are interested in American history don't know how important Wayne was in winning this victory. I mean, everything I've set up so far and tried to tell you, like, his winning the Battle of Fallen Timbers, his building the army that I'm talking about from absolute scratch. There had never been a nationally run professional army before. He, and of course, as you now know, the, the sort of stopgap version of that was virtually almost entirely wiped out in the Sinclair defeat. So uh, his building that army and his actually winning the Battle of Fallen Timbers to actually conquer the territory that would then become the industrial Midwest, and not all that long afterward either did that start. Um, his importance is, is sort of epic and amazing to me. Uh, and it's amazing that people just don't, even if people have heard of him, they go, oh yeah, Matt Anthony Wayne, some kind of, he must have been crazy or something. Um, he was quite a personality. He was irascible, he was intense. Um, the way I see him, I mean, when Washington appointed Wayne to take over, not take over, actually create this army and lead it, hopefully, to victory, um, he was like, I mean, people said, Anthony Wayne? Because he had been a very successful officer in the Revolution with some very important uh, exploits to his credit. But by the time, in 1792, when he got this appointment, he had just bottomed out, really, as a person. He'd gone into, like, the rice business, trying to become a sort of a... He came from, you know, he's from Chester County. I mean, he was not a southern guy. He went down south and 
started up a big rice plantation and just went completely bust trying to be like a, like a Washington or one of those like southern plantation owners, getting into de spirals and spirals of debt and his personal life is just sort of unraveling and his, he, his family is just, he's alienated from his family and every decision he made just leads to more and more nightmares and by the time he was appointed, he was back in Philadelphia uh, in because this was where the capital was, as probably a lot of you know at that time, it wasn't in Washington. Um, but he was back in Philadelphia serving in the Congress and being indicted, investigated for uh, election fraud and getting his seat. Uh, and, and in fact, it was proven that he had engaged in election fraud and he was thrown out of the Congress. And then he was appointed. Then Washington says, we're going to have Anthony Wayne take over this army. And people who were already skeptical about the idea that, that this army should even exist we're like, Anthony Wayne, I mean, come on, no, you know, this, this just shows that you have no idea what you're doing. It could have gone down in history as one of Washington's worst decisions, really. But it didn't. Um, he did build that army. The thing about Wayne that was so amazing, um, and I don't have time to get into the military history aspects of this now, but that was so amazing was that he was terrible at everything else in life, as far as I can see, but he was really, he was just like adapted, fully adapted to leadership in war. And so he finally got to do, kind of later, late, uh, kind of a, a, late in life, you could say, he finally got to do the thing he was really, really good at. And then he just never looked up. And he took these recruits and trained them and trained them and trained them and flogged them and flogged them and flogged them and hanged some of them. I mean, it's a brutal, again, we pass, I'll pass over the details uh, now, but they're in the book of what it really takes to, took to build a European style army in those days uh, from nothing, from these recruits you were taking out into the middle of nowhere. Uh, and, you know, desertion rates were extraordinary. I mean, people just threw down their guns and ran away. It was just, they didn't even know where they were going. Just, let's get out of here. He had to deal with all that, and he dealt with it with great harshness at times, but he created an esprit de corps that had never existed before. Uh, he created a whole new army, and then he led it to actual victory, and it was, it was touch and go, you know. It was touch and go all the way. So his, his and, and his, uh, he's Mad Anthony, which makes people think he's sort of like, um, He's impetuous, or he takes stupid risks, or he's just sort of inconsistent. Not at all. I mean, what, what, what he was mad for was, was security, like where Sinclair had not even fortified his encampment and got surprised. Wayne would march just, he, would, he had incredible patience, march everybody X number of hours a day on the march, heading toward the final battle, and then like 3 o'clock in the afternoon or whenever, whatever time it had to be, stop dead and spend like six hours maybe fortifying the camp. I mean, and don't, you know, it's all delayed gratification. Just get every step exactly right. He was maniacal for that. Um, and then at other times he took insane risks. But they were only, only when it kind of seemed like there was no other choice or it was like he had an incredible nose for when it was the right time to take a crazy risk. Um, so he wasn't crazy. He was sort of an amazing character. And without him, you know, people don't talk about him as one of the great generals. People are, he's known somewhat better here than other places. But, you know, without him really... You know, no, no Lee, no Grant, no Patton, you know, like without this guy, I mean, he really did the thing. He created the army. He created generalship for the United States. So we need to give him, you know, you don't have to be on his side. You don't have to be on Little Turtle and Blue Jacket's side. We need to give these people some, uh, some regard, I think. And I'll close by noting, um, noting one of the reasons I think it is hard to talk about Wayne. He, his obscurity as a great general is, is, is more, is recent. For a long time, he was um, talked about a lot, and people glorified him and hymned his achievements. But the kind of people who did that were like Teddy Roosevelt, for example, who thought Wayne was the most important you know, founding force in America. But here's the thing. The way Teddy Roosevelt would put that is that Wayne, you know, Anthony Wayne is great because without him, this great thing wouldn't have happened. And that thing was to transfer the gigantic wealth of a continent from an inferior race, as Roosevelt saw it, to a superior race, as Roosevelt saw it. And so that was the context in which Wayne was once known, celebrated, and, and uh, hymned. Um, and that's not a context in which you want to acknowledge people today. And in fact, there was a lot of pushback against that in Roosevelt's time, too, as there should have been. But what we tend to do is if we can't deal with people like that, we just forget about them. Um, and there might be another way to go instead. I don't know exactly what that way is, but by unearthing these stories, that's kind of part of what I'm trying to do is instead of saying, well, that's kind of gross because, you know, it is, um, let's not think about it. 
Generally, I'm trying to kind of unearth the things that are uncomfortable to think about, but also get the imagination going. You know, like I could talk about this for hours, but I'm actually about to stop. It would all just be talk. It would all be an essay on the interesting issues that arise from the story. The point of writing a book, and as readers know, the point of reading a book is to actually go there for, for in some kind of real way, not just talk about it. Engage emotionally, imaginatively with the characters, and you'll find yourself liking people like Anthony Wayne sometimes at some weird moments, and also hating them at other times. And that's kind of the that's kind of my the approach I'm trying to trying to fulfill. Um, and so this is now the conclusion of my me talking alone part of the evening. And I guess we're going to move, we can move on to some, if you guys have um, questions or comments. Before we get to that, because I always forget to do this if I don't do it right now at this point in any evening, uh, thank you so much to the Free Library for having me here. Uh, Joseph Fox Bookshop, also another great institution uh, of the book and of knowledge um, in the country, really. And it's a great, great thrill to be here under these circumstances. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, it seems to me that uh, General Wayne is another example of George Washington's great ability to pick uh, leaders uh, where others might not have seen it. Do you write and do you have views about Washington's ability to uh, identify talent and to promote people that others might not see? Yeah, well, Wayne's a great example of that. And um, one, one of the points I try to make in the, in the book, I, I touched on it a minute ago, but um, you know, Hamilton and Jefferson, who are, seen, who are so divergent in their thinking, and of course hated each other's guts and tried to undermine each other at every possible opportunity in the cabinet, uh, worked together in the story I'm telling. They weren't always just at odds. And I think you know, it's incredible to look at, I mean, their, their tension in the cabinet meetings was unbearable for Washington. You know, but he actually knew at that moment, just what you're saying, that th those were the two guys he needed, that sort of team of rivals thing that we talk about. I mean, that he, he was great at that. Um, when it comes to Wayne, um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a different question, the, I think. The, uh, when, they, when they decided they needed, you know, they need to build an army, we got the army bill passed, who's going to run this thing? They have these cabinet meetings, which I describe in the book, and you can look at their notes, their original notes. I mean, Jefferson took a lot of great cabinet notes. Um, they're funny partly because he's always making his little snotty side comments to himself about Hamilton. And, but uh, but they, they go down the list of generals and they're just kind of like, they're all just kind of like, eh, you know, we don't really have the talent. Who's going to do this? And Washington had this weird obsession with the idea that all of, the, all of the generals were drunks. He just decided that. I mean, it really wasn't true in most cases, but he's just deeply concerned that they were all drunk all the time and he just kept harping on that issue. I don't think when he picked Wayne, he, he had a lot of confidence in Wayne at that moment. He should have, um, but he did, he did a lot of, um, he did a great deal of like encouraging people and then holding them back. And he did that with Wayne in the revolution and he did it again in, the, in this book. And um, I think it was a kind of a brilliant, I don't believe he actually thought, oh, they're all gonna find out Wayne's the guy. I think he felt it was the least objectionable choice. But in managing Wayne, he, he made some incredibly extreme moves, which I talk about in the book, where he, he really held him back against, you know, I mean, Wayne was sitting there taking casualties in the field, and, not, and Washington wasn't giving him permission to, to advance, and that's the worst thing, situation a general can be in, probably. And Washington played that to the nth degree to achieve his political ends. Um, so he was brilliant in that and many other ways. Um, so you've convinced us how important this war was and how systematically it's been overlooked. Do you have any idea why it's been overlooked? Well, yeah, I mean, I've been thinking about it a lot, so I should have some idea. Um, but I do, I do continue to find it a little mysterious. I mean, there's this amni I mean, first of all, I don't know. I mean, there's a simple answer that I have no idea if it's correct, but it's just, if you think about, I mean, a lot of people are really into Tecumseh. You know, and yet he never really won any battles against the U.S. Maybe we don't want to think about the biggest victory over U.S. forces that ever happened for, by indigenous people. Maybe, maybe we just don't like it. Maybe it just seems kind of embarrassing. I mean, it was embarrassing to Washington, of course, but like, it seems like we should have grown out of that by now, maybe. But it's a story that begins in defeat, not in glory, but in defeat. And it ends in victory, but again, 
on the maybe the deeper level, that victory begins um, the story of the treaty period, as it's frequently known in U.S. and uh, Native relations, and that's a story of what becomes Indian removal, and it doesn't which is, you know, widely classed a crime against humanity. And it begins here. It doesn't, you know, we like to throw all that off on Andrew Jackson, right? Because he's a bad guy in so many ways, why not just load all that on him too? But actually, it begins with the founders, okay? And that's not a comfortable thing to live with. The fact that Indian removal begins with, I mean, you can see the documents where Jefferson muses on whether all the Indians really should be moved across the Mississippi. Jefferson put it like, for their own good, he said. That's an exact quote. Um, Jackson didn't indulge in that kind of um, hand-wringing necessarily. But the, the, actual, you know, the actual process of Indian removal begins with the founding and plays into the very formation of the nation. It wasn't just a little, oh, that was bad, but everything else was great. It was critical to forming what the vision that Hamilton and Jefferson shared, they, and Washington, they all called it an empire. You know, they didn't, this, this idea that we have that there was a lean, mean little republic, and if only we had not expanded, didn't play for them. They were always interested in expanding. So I think all of these issues are quite uncomfortable to look at when we talk about the formation of the nation and our founders. So I think that's one of the reasons this thing has been pushed aside. Uh, curious, given the context and interest of the time, had we lost that war, would that have stopped the westward expansion or just slowed it and it would have been inevitable anyway? Yeah, that's a great what if. I mean, that's, you know, historians aren't supposed to indulge in what ifs, um, but that's a really good one because certainly the people at the time had to be, everybody on every side had to be thinking what if. Washington didn't know that Wayne was going to win at Fallen Timbers. So he had to be thinking, well, you know, I don't know what he was thinking, but he had to be thinking something like, if, if it's another Sinclair defeat, I don't know, what do we do next? I mean, the, the, uh, the Congress would, after all that trouble to get that army bill passed and all the money and all the ob objections to it anyway, and then they had another horrible defeat, there wasn't a huge appetite on the part of the American people as a whole for taking that land, by the way. Again, this gets into the whole settlement issue. You know, it isn't like throngs of people like Little House on the Prairie, just we want to get out there and start busting sod. You know, that wasn't what really, what was really driving this. It was a massive real estate investment benefiting a small number of people. So you know, the political will to continue that war after another defeat would have been, and, and just restarting an army, I, I can't, it would have, there would have been a long period where that would have been very hard to pull off politically. So then what would have happened? Well, nobody knows what would have happened. Um, uh, so I, I don't think you have to imagine a, t a world in which those, that confederation of nations would have held on to their land forever necessarily. Um, but the British had an interest in trying to create a buffer zone and getting back at least some control over what they had given up. So they were allied with, with the native confederation and the British might have been able to really make that stick for at least for a long time. Spain would have seen the U.S. as, as maybe terminally weak on its western frontier and started moving eastward because, of course, they were still across the Mississippi. But they had designs on that, you know, kind of vague designs, but if they saw an opportunity, they might have taken it. I think Washington and Hamilton and Jefferson were all correct to think that it was critically important to actual American nationhood to get a hold of that territory and assert sovereignty there, um, which again is an uncomfortable thing to, to notice. But um, so I, I think there was a lot of suspense about what was going to happen and that what might have happened, there's a number of different scenarios, but there, was, but there was no inevitability in the minds of anybody involved that the US was just gonna start rolling over everyone who was there, because as Sinclair's defeat had proven, that was just certainly not in the bag at all. You partially uh, hinted at this a little bit, but I was curious as to how um, they, as Congress and the leaders uh, characterized the um, need to build the army. Did they, uh, there was a narrative uh, more defensive, offensive, we must uh, manifest destiny kind of thing, or was it something that they, um, uh, said that we need to defend ourselves against these savages, as kind of it alludes to in the, the yeah. Declaration of Independence. Yeah. Right. That, that, that's a key question. I mean, that's a key issue. And uh, it was justified, uh, you know, and sort of rationalized in all of the ways you just mentioned, uh, to some extent. Um, you know, that land had been ceded by treaty by Great Britain to the, United, to the United States. So there was a certain obvious justification. That's just ours, you know, and the fact that we are unable to settle it, unable to develop it, unable to make money on it, unable to assert sovereignty means there's something wrong and we have to fight for it. And that made a lot of logical sense if you just follow all those steps. 
Um, the indigenous people had a different attitude because, you know, um, the U.S. showed up, at, uh, came up with these treaties, and we're like, uh, we've just won the War of Independence, so, you know, this is all ours now, so sign here, or whatever. And the, uh, the nations said, well, you didn't defeat us in the War of Independence. We're still fighting you. For, the, for them, it was an ongoing war. The War of Independence didn't mean that much to them, except that their British allies had now abandoned, largely abandoned them. But they didn't feel defeated. Um, and so it took actual, you know, victory in the field to get them to sign treaties. They weren't just going to collapse and do it. Um, so there were, there were numbers of, a number of rationalizations and reasons, actually, because of the people were, you know, white people were living there, and the violence of the Indians was atrocious in many ways, and so there was a, nat a natural terror of that. But I should also note, this makes me r realize, I should also note that there was also great pushback um, among people in the East about doing any of this. There were people who thought Indians were like better than white people because they, they were because they had a condescending idea that they were closer to nature and more sort of no, natural noblemen and so forth. But there was a romantic idea of Indians that, that uh, made some people object to the war on that basis. Other people were just anti-war, like the Quakers sent a petition to Washington saying, don't prosecute this war, it's wrong. Also note that the war, this war was never declared by Congress a war. So it was easy to come, sort of get around some of it and treat it defensively, as you're saying, because our first war, the war that started everything else that we ever did, was undeclared. I mean, I always thought that started with Korea and Vietnam when I was younger, but it uh, turns out when we, did, when we stopped declaring wars, we went back to our roots. Another, uh, you know, not, all, not comfortable thing to think about, but because it wasn't declared as a war, even though they knew it was a war, I mean, Washington and Knox said to each other, you know, this is a war. What's happening? This is a war. We've got to win this thing. But it wasn't declared by Congress because of the racial prejudice, in I mean, the racial, you know, more than prejudice, the racial idea, I think, that you, you don't have war with Indians, you just have this other thing which we don't call a war, even though they were deeply involved in perhaps the most decisive war we've ever fought. So there were a number of rationalizations, and there were a number of reasons for objection, too. Uh, it wasn't like everybody was for this. Uh, yeah. First, I wanted to thank you because I often need to escape from political distress by reading about national creation and destruction, and I feel like I've got a lot of hours that'll keep me away. And I want to ask a sort of an unanswerable follow-up to my colleague's uh, question. You said that General Wayne had a nose for when to take the right risk. Yeah. Yeah. Of uh, when to take the right risk. Yeah. Did he have such a nose, or was it more of an accidental historical path dependence right. that he got seven rolls of the dice that went right, or his particular personality just happened to come up against the enemies that worked for him, and there wasn't an incredible nose at all? It was partly luck, because it seems so much of history in finance and politics, luck plays a big role. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, I don't know whether it was really a nose in the way I was just describing it in that way. It seemed that way, you know? Um, but yeah, sure, it was like, you know, in Apocalypse Now, there's the Robert Duvall character who can stand right next to things just blowing up all around him, and he's just, everything's fine, you know? Um, and people are dying all around him. I mean, and it, obviously, there's no magical power that a guy like that would have in real life, and Wayne didn't have, like, that kind of magical power either. I do, you know, I, don't, I can't ascribe it either to his, you know, he had some kind of instincts, uh, I think, but I, I couldn't go too much further than that. I mean, I think he did have amazing instincts. I think there are military figures who have surprisingly good instincts that even they could not actually describe. It's sort of like, yeah, it could be luck. I mean, it's like, any, it's like an artist who paints a brilliant you know, picture or whatever. And so, and, it's sort of like, what, where did that come from? You know, well, it comes from training and it comes from practice and expertise. But like, then there's that extra little thing that nobody can explain. But of course, he had luck. I mean, he had incredible luck uh, on the on the march. He almost got killed on the march because a tree fell on him. Like, so that would have changed everything, right? Right there. But it missed his head, crushed a part of his leg. Um, but he had this incredible ability. He's like, he instantly got on his horse. I mean, they had to revive him, you know. And then he heard rumors were going around the camp that, uh, that the general had been killed. So he just gets them to hoist him up on his horse so he can ride around the camp to show everybody that he's alive and well. And like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Everything's fine. And he ends up doing his final march. You know, and he had a horrible gout and then this tree fell on him, and he's basically falling apart physically all the way up the march, and he's riding out in front of everybody else. I'm, again, taking these crazy risks. Like, his, his, his junior officers were like, this, what is he doing? Like, he can't be out in front. He's in front of the scouts. This is nuts. 
But it had some, you know, whether it was a nose for something, I don't know what it was, but it had some amazing effect on the men, certainly. I mean, after the victory, the men really did, I think, really love him in, some, in that way, in that particular kind of dynamic. So yeah, it's a good point. I mean, he had unbelievable luck, you know. He had terrible luck in business. And then also made some terror, had, had the worst nose for business also that anyone could have. And then he had some real luck on this, on this march as well, yeah. Didn't these Indian wars go on throughout the 19th century, mm -hmm. both before and after the Civil War? And really, getting back to your comment, we know about the War of 1812, we know about the Civil War, but th th it doesn't seem to be anybody pulls these, all this Indian War history with different tribes together and treats it as a whole. Yeah, uh, there is another, there's a book, I just did a, a talk at the Gaithersburg uh, Book Festival, a panel of two, it was a little weird, but it worked out pretty well, with Peter Cousins, who wrote a book called The Earth is Weeping, which is really the epic story of the Plains Indians Wars, and he covers it all, I mean, like, it's a big, sweeping book with all that stuff, but he doesn't have this story, and you know, and I don't have his story, so the two of us were, were saying exactly what you're saying, that there is no work that actually pulls his stuff together with my stuff and creates this comprehensive history. That's true. I don't think there really is one book that does that. Or at least does it in as much depth as I do with this and that Cousins does with his, with his stuff. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the population that the nor Northwestern Indians had and what kind of weapons they had in terms of how their firepower, in effect, compared with what the uh, uh, U.S. Army uh, or the Butler brothers uh, brought to bear? Yeah. The, uh, the comp I mean, the composition of the Confederation, I'm t I didn't get to talk about it much. The, uh, this was a gigantic uh, confederation of different nations and branches, um, but its core was uh, Shawnee, Miami, and Delaware um, <clears throat> in relationship to the, uh, to the five and then six nations of the Iroquois to the east. So there was a, and they had a, I mean, again, politics. You know, there's a lot of politics in the founding uh, in the, uh, among the founders, and we like to think of them as more like philosophers, but they were doing politics every day. Similarly, people like to think of um, Native Americans as not being that into politics. The politics among all of these tribes and, and the meetings that they had that went on for weeks and their caucuses and the discussions are, are quite complicated and the relationships among all this, these populations were, were fraught and difficult, and yet they still managed to pull together an amazing, um, an amazing confederation. Um, the weaponry, you know, their weapons were the whole uh, gamut. They, they used, of course, bow and arrow, but they also, they used uh, muskets. They had, they had muskets. They, were, they had been armed. I mean, this is the other thing, like, it's hard to wrap our minds around, maybe, um, given the stereotypes. But for, you know, for a long, long, long time, European cultures and indigenous cultures had been uh, ha having trade. There, were, there was a whole lines of muskets that were made uh, in France and England that were, um, that were designed for the Indian trade, basically. Um, so they were, they were stocked up on uh, firearms, and the British were supporting them in their effort against the U.S. up to a point, up to a very tragic point where the British backed out at a crucial moment. Um, but um, they, they, had, they had that kind of armament. What they didn't have, what the British wouldn't give them, that Little Turtle especially thought they needed or they were done, was artillery. And the British wouldn't commit to that degree because they couldn't just give them artillery. They would have had to assign, you know, or, uh, troops that knew how to do artillery. And at that point, it would have the proxy war that the British were trying to fight would have been exposed, and they would have clearly been at war with the U.S. So they never got artillery. And Little Turtle always said, "Blue Jacket was like, we're going to win because it's right, and we beat Sinclair, and you know, we're just going to win." And Little Turtle was like, "Not without artillery. We need artillery," and that becomes one of the differences between them. But they were well armed, well armed with European style weaponry. I guess uh, I think I think we've I think we've done it here, people. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for your.